Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. If there's one thing we've learned when filming Wild Kingdom, it's that nature can be harsh. Not all animals are strong and healthy enough to survive. In tonight's episode, we'll explore the relationship between predator and prey. Each plays an important role in keeping animal populations in check. The old and the sickly animals are naturally weeded out, leaving the strong and the healthy to produce the next generation. In fact, predators are only successful about 50% of their attempts to catch food. This reality can seem harsh, but it's absolutely necessary to create that delicate yet natural balance of the animals in the wild kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Today, as we continue our close look at the research being done in the Snake River Birds of Prey natural area of Idaho, we will scale the sides of cliffs to observe the scientists as they study and mark fledgling birds of prey. This is part of the research conducted to save the hunting area of the birds from possible disruption by farming. Under pressure to grant farming rights, the Bureau of Land Management needs to know if farming can be done here on the plateaus where the predatory birds hunt without the natural balance of these birds being upset. In order to find some answers, it was necessary to capture a golden eagle, one of the largest and most beautiful birds of prey. A most unusual trapping method was used and it all took place here in Idaho, where the Snake River weaves through the southwestern portion of the state, and where skilled researchers were helping to save the Snake River birds of prey. The melancholy yet movingly beautiful cry of the coyote heralds the dawn from the rim of the Snake River Canyon. It becomes almost a signal, evoking the cry of another predator echoing among the canyon walls. It's the scream of the magnificent golden eagle. This is one of the more abundant of the many species of predatory birds which soar on the early morning thermal currents. As the birds of prey are early risers here at the Snake River Birds of Prey Natural Area, so too are the men who devote their time and energy to study them and help preserve them and their habitat. The Bureau of Land Management scientists are making an intensive study here of the raptors, which are the birds of prey in order to determine whether or not farming on the plateaus above will be injurious to them. Observations and research here are under the direction of Mike Cokert, project leader and research biologist for the Bureau of Land Management. He also acts as liaison between that agency and private scientists. We're heading now for an area of the Snake River Canyon cliffs where predatory bird studies are being made at nesting sites called eyries of falcons and eagles. There's another golden eagle. The white in its tail indicates that it's still immature. Perhaps next season, it too will be nesting in these cliffs. A powerfully built and very handsome bird the golden eagle is only one of many species of predators found here. Most four-legged predators, however, such as these coyotes, won't be as detrimentally affected by the proposed farming as will the birds of prey. 
The coyotes are far more adaptable to the alteration of their habitat through agricultural changes than are the falcons or eagles. Unfortunately, when farming commences, much of the food source of the birds of prey disappears, and so the birds may be lost also. That's the whole purpose of the research here, to determine if any of the land can be farmed without decimation of the birds of prey. Much of that research is occurring near the tops of the sheer walls of the canyon, and so we're heading there now. It's among the clefts of the canyon walls, just below the high plateau we're approaching, where the falcons and eagles are nesting. Aiding in the research here at the top is Mike's assistant, Rich Howard, who will help in Mike's descent by rope over the lip of the canyon. The eagles are becoming accustomed to the daily appearance of the researchers, along with all their vehicles and equipment. From this point on, the research gets a bit risky for Mike, since it's he who'll be moving down the cliff face to work on some of the fledgling birds of prey that have been located in eyries directly below this point. In fact, he should be able to reach both a falcon nest and an eagle nest on this one descent. Although the descent could be made unaided, Rich Howard's paying out of the safety line makes Mike Cokert's job as safe as possible. The first nest is about 40 feet down from the top. It's the eyrie of one of the many pairs of prairie falcons which nest in this canyon each year. This very handsome bird of prey would be the most jeopardized if farming was allowed on the plateaus above. I've come to the nest area now, and even though my descent was carefully watched by the parent prairie falcon, the bird is unlikely to attack me. Nevertheless, it's wise to always remain alert to that possibility. Whether it's in handling a fledgling like this, or an adult bird, the beak is not the greatest danger to watch out for. It's the powerful talons which are most used in defense. So it's important when handling birds of prey to pin the talons so they can't grab, as they can cause painful injury. Our studies have shown that the Townsend ground squirrels of the plateau are the principal prey of prairie falcons, and the birds will vanish here if the food source is destroyed. Harmlessly marking the flight feathers allows us to trace the movements of these birds as they begin to hunt. In doing so, we learn how much plateau area they'll require individually as hunting range. Such information will help us reach very important conclusions. The next stage of the research found Mike Coker climbing farther down the sheer rock face of the cliff to an eagle eyrie where the fledglings could be studied and marked. Rich Howard and I continue to observe from here the work being done on the cliff face below us by Mike. He's indicating that he's finished here, and the adult falcon can return to its nest. <laughs> Mike.
Now he'll continue down the cliff face another 50 or 60 feet to the slightly broader ledge area where the eagle's nest is located. Again, it's important for Mike not only to descend carefully, but also to be wary of any possible attack from the parent who's watching from close by. She's nervous, but past experience has proven that it's most unlikely she'll cause any problem. Mike has reached the ledge where the Eagle Eyrie is located, and he's able to put his full weight on it safely. The fledglings are good-sized already. As with the falcons, it's not their bite that Mike's got to be careful of as he works on them. The real danger lies in the strong talons. Most of the threatening with the hooked beak is just bluff. The first step will be to check the inside of the mouths of the eaglets for any sign of two diseases. The first is a disease called aspergillosis, which causes a clog in the respiratory tract. The other is a disease called trichomoniasis, which restricts eating and causes starvation. Either will eventually cause death. Fortunately, neither chick is afflicted. Though the bird is young, its legs are already strong and require firm holding while preparing to attach the identification band. Where possible, standard leg bands are put on as permanent markers, since there's a good chance that the bird will be caught by us as an adult as our research work here continues. Recovery of such banded birds gives us solid information regarding the individual ranges and hunting territories of the birds. It's also a record of age and development. Part of the research includes preparing a sling in which to weigh the fledgling. It's a standard growth rate study which becomes part of the record of each bird captured and marked. The age and size of this specimen indicate that it should weigh about four pounds. And as it turns out, that's almost precisely what this fledgling weighs. As an adult, though, it may weigh as much as 12 pounds and have a wingspan of over seven and a half feet. Another part of the research includes marking the birds with a color-coded permanent band placed around the base of one wing. This is simply a marker which tells us at a glance the year the bird was banded in a particular area. A red band like this over the right wing might indicate 1976. A red band over the left wing might have been the mark for three or four years earlier. Finally, they're each given a drink of water to keep body moisture high and prevent possible dehydration in case the adult birds are a long time in returning to the young after our departure from working on them. It won't be long until these youngsters are out there with the other eagles, skillfully riding the thermal air currents. Some of the scientists in this research project are preparing to catch an eagle now. Dr. Tom Dunstan, 
of Western Illinois University hopes to be able to capture that large, immature golden eagle which has been soaring over us much of the day. In fact, we're heading for the location where one of the contract researchers working under Dr. Dunstan's direction hopes to lure the big bird down and then catch it. Now that we've arrived within sight of the capture area, Morley Nelson can begin his important task. The structure to be used in the capture is not itself a trap, but rather a blind. Morley already has a rabbit carcass which can be used to entice the bird to land. However, to prevent the bird from simply picking it up and carrying it away, he anchors it securely to the blind. Now, nothing remains to be done except for Morley himself to get under the blind and be prepared to grab the big bird of prey if and when it lands. The eagle is already showing signs of interest in the bait. It's merely a pass this time, but that's not unusual. It should swing back again very soon. Although the eagle had veered away from the trap on the first pass, Morley Nelson was sure it would be back, and he was right. As we expected, the eagle is still interested in the rabbit carcass on the blind, and now to make the bird more curious, Morley puts his hand near the carcass to simulate movement of the bait. That did it. He's coming back. The eagle must look away in order for it to be grabbed by surprise, lest it leap away too soon and escape. With the bird finally away from the blind and on the open ground, Morley's able to pin the wings to prevent any injury to the bird and to await the arrival of Dr. Dunstan for the work they'll do next. As is customary in capturing birds of prey, it's important to first get a hood over the eyes, as this has the immediate effect of calming the bird and lessening the possibility of the bird injuring itself or one of the scientists during its struggles.
The prime reason for capturing this bird is so it can be fitted with one of the specially designed radio telemetry harnesses which are made to fit comfortably on the bird's back. Such a radio and harness serves a dual purpose. The radio is within the harness and will broadcast its signal several years. By monitoring that signal, they'll trace the bird's movements and ascertain where it hunts most often and how large a hunting range it requires. The harness is color-coded and just by seeing the yellow color, the researchers will know what year the eagle was marked and in what area. The long trailer of the harness carries the transmitting antenna. It hasn't taken long to do the job, and now a check on the radio signal being transmitted is all that remains to be done. Jim Harper gets a good signal on the receiver. Now it's all right to release the captive bird to roam and hunt wherever it will. As is often the case when the hood is removed, and one of the captured birds is set free, it is momentarily confused and remains in place for a little while. The scientists will regularly monitor the signal being received, and it will be one more element to add to the increasing knowledge of what the basic requirements are of range and hunting area for these magnificent predatory birds. That information will be correlated with research already completed or yet to be done by the scientists working here. It will be of aid to the Bureau of Land Management in making land use decisions to ensure the safe existence of the Snake River Birds of Prey. Just as it is very important to utilize our natural resources well and permit multiple uses wherever possible, care must be taken that one does not harm another. In soliciting the aid of many scientists to study the situation from different aspects, the Bureau of Land Management sets an example of how best to approach and solve such matters. By researching and learning all facts before making a decision, the wisest use of our natural resources, both land and wildlife, becomes possible. As long as such examples of concern for our natural resources prevail and increase, we can rest easy in the knowledge that there will always be a wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.